Welcome back everybody to another episode of Light Lessons with Sierra. This week we are focusing on the word responsibility. This is not a real tattoo you guys. This is a sage or maybe a eucalyptus. I think it's eucalyptus. I'm really really excited to share this episode with you this week. This is very extra special for me and now for all of you as you will see one of my favorite light workers and just people and friends, Daniel Watts. Listen to what he has to say. Check out the links below uh, to find out more about Daniel. I am so excited. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next episode of Light Lessons with Sierra featuring Daniel Watts. A good shirt choice. We're casual. I'm so hot. Go. It's hot. I was like, okay. mm -hmm. nope. here we go. We're starting. All right. Woo! The very first thing that we need to get out of the way is that at some time in this interview, I might be addressing you as Sanka. Sure. You might be addressing me as Doris. So I need to let the people know. I have known Daniel for, well, 13, 13 years. 2007? Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> We've yeah. done a whole lot together. Heap, heap. Heap, man, heap. When we met, we met doing Little Mermaid on Broadway. Mermaid. And you were one of the very first friends that I made during that show. For some reason, I was like instantly like, this is my people. Yeah, oh my I don't remember how that happened, but it was, that's exactly what happened, yeah. yeah. And I don't remember why, within, I, I feel like it was our first conversation, we talked about cool runnings. And we loved it. <laughs> and that was it, and so from then on, it was Sanka and Doris. Sanka and Doris, Doris, she's smoking mine. <laughs> I'm not smoking, I'm breathing. <laughs> that was it. That's and there it. you guys go. There, thus is the history of Daniel and Sierra knowing each other. Welcome. I'm so grateful that you're here today. I'm so good to see you. I want to talk to you about your journey. Not only are you one of the greatest dancers ever, singers, actors, you are such an actual triple threat. You've done like nine Broadway shows too. What, how dare you? How dare you with that? Just <sighs> Here's what's really funny about that is that I was doing After Midnight and I at that point I had seven shows and everyone's like, Daniel, you're going to get the road, you know? And I was like, nope, because Bahia had done eight shows, Rosina had done 10 shows, and then T. Oliver had done 11 shows. Like, it was like, my little seven. <laughs> it didn't even matter. Seven shows. Get out of here. Have you ever had the road? Mm-mm. I never got it. Well... Broadway needs to reopen. Yeah, well, you can't nope. get it with these lead roles. Hey. hey. Uh, <laughs> Tell everybody where you're from. I'm from, uh, my mother now lives in Indian Trail, North Carolina, which is about 20 minutes outside of Charlotte. I was born in Charlotte and then kind of bounced around both North and South Carolina for like my whole life. What's Elon? For uh, Elon University, it was Elon College when I got there. Elon University for music theater. Come on, graduated. great. Come on. And then <laughs> they had a BFA that, that means nothing. I know. And I can't do anything with this, but no. I'm going to do it. <laughs> and then bounced around, did like the regional theater thing. And that's when I really started really writing. Like I've been writing since I was a kid, you know. Um, but like I, re I remember taking the time to really write in these various regional theaters and dinner theaters all over the world. Like I can kind of remember like, oh, that's when I wrote that. Or that's when I started like dabbling with that. Moved to the city in 2006, didn't know nothing, but knew a lot of people from having done all the regional work and made my Broadway debut in The Color Purple that September, which is crazy because I moved to New York and I saw The Color Purple the night I moved to the city. It's the first thing I saw. Are you serious? It's the first thing I saw. And I remember watching it and was like, I can do this. And then I got the show and I was like, I can't do this. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is Broadway's hard because I was a swing. I was a swing and I didn't know what that meant. You know, I'd never heard of such a thing. It being my first job, I was just a little bit like <laughs> terrified, you know. And then I left The Color Purple to do this new musical that Disney was doing, putting together called The Little Mermaid. And that's where I met you. And, and that's and, it. You don't need and that's the it. And, that's, and the rest is history. The rest is a little history. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Could you imagine? 
<laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> what if it closed? And I was like, oh, <laughs> jokes. When bits go too far. I know. Would have been funny though. <laughs> Worth it. I left Little Mermaid and went to, and kind of like jumped back onto the regional theater thing and jumped into a show called Memphis before it came to Broadway. Left that, went to In the Heights to be a swing again. And this is when it really twisted. I found that I was in In the Heights. In the Heights was the show that I was auditioning for. And I got cut, found out that I booked The Color Purple after I got cut from In the Heights. So it was like this whole, it was like a circle. Oh my God. It finally come back around. And then I hadn't dreamed any bigger than that. So like I got back to like the dream show, did In the Heights and then it closed. And I was like, now what? So I went back to Memphis temporarily because somebody had like a vacation or something. So I did that. I went to Seattle to do Aladdin to play the carpet. Oh, from the bubbles carpet. to carpet. Bubble, went from bubbles, bubbles. You bubbles. We have to tell that story. We do have to tell that story. Can we tell it now? We should. Go. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> long story short, I had a costume that was like this color. This is um, Little Mermaid. This is Little Mermaid. And it was like a, it was a bodysuit and it ombre from this color in the pants to my complexion up top, right? And there's glitter and there's lip gloss and a hat that's got coral in it and a little fish, right? I look like Carmen Miranda, in all honesty. And one day I asked the costume designer, I was like, what am I? <laughs> and she's Russian, you know, and she was like, you're Bobbles. And I was like, Bob, Bob, Bobbles? She's like, you know, Bobbles, 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 Bobbles. And I was like, Bubbles. I'm Bubbles. And they were like, I had this like little power belt and there was like little bubbles on the belt. And that's what made me the Bubbles. <laughs> I was like, you're Bubbles. And I was like, of course. Of course I am. Still, that is a hashtag I use when I text you just for anything. <laughs> Bubbles. Bubbles. Hashtag bubbles. Never forget. Never so, forget. <laughs> so I'm from bubbles to being the carpet. Got to five days into the rehearsal process and the director was like, so we know by now the carpet's cut. And I was like, didn't know that. Like, Is it something I said? Nobody told me the carpet was cut. So and they had kind of like mapped out the show, but didn't really have a place for me. So I spent a lot of time off stage doing this, so I was like, let me start writing stuff. And that's when I started working on this show called The Jam. Um, that's when. That, that was the inception of The Jam. That's what happened. So yeah, Jam, we'll talk about that later. Then we just kind of like, okay, we're back in show. I did Ghost, and then Motown, and then After Midnight, and then I jumped into this little skit called Hamilton for a little never. bit, and then never really made it. Uh, and then <laughs> went to LA for a little bit, jumped into some TV and film, did a show called the Last OG with Tracy Morgan and The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel and some other stuff. And then Broadway called again and was like, hey, you want to be Ike Turner in this Tina Turner musical? And I was like, I don't know. Why didn't you know? Because it's Ike Turner. You know, nobody likes Ike Turner. I haven't given Ike Turner a second thought other than, you know, Lawrence Fishburne and What's Love Got to Do With It. And nothing about that was like, ooh, I want to, that looks fun. <laughs> <laughs> nothing about it. You know, Adrian Warren, who I've known for, 11 years now was playing Tina Turner. So like, oh, she's doing it, I'll do it. That helped. But this is the thing that I love about you too. And this goes to our word responsibility is you are somebody who you're such a hard worker and you do the work. And I'll never forget that once you did book that, you took the Ike Turner, you know, like trip of a lifetime. A lifetime, yeah. And I was so impressed with all the work that you were doing and just the empathy that you were finding for him. We all know that this is going to be the villain, I guess, of the piece, but that's what I loved about your performance so much. She was so layered with just like your heart broke for this man too. But like, I think I said this to you in the dressing room too, that she can't do everything that she does if you aren't also giving, you know what I mean? I just want to highlight that for everybody that's watching. It's the work that you did to genuinely understand the responsibility that you have to tell this story. I mean, you like went to his home. What did you do? Exactly? Yes, I read, I went, it started with, when I first got the audition, I was like, you know, so I was like, let me do some research. And I saw that, you know, his father had been killed by a white lynch mob, you know, 
and they didn't kill him right away, but he ended up succumbing to his injuries. He apparently was uh, molested as a child too. So once I saw those two points, I was like, oh, that explains everything. This is a hurt person. Okay, different. Okay, I found out he had an autobiography, so I read his autobiography, and then I found out his house is still there. So uh, in Clark, he's from Clarksdale, Mississippi. So I went to Clarksdale, Mississippi, and I went to Memphis first because he spent a lot of time in Memphis, like recording music, went by like all the places where he used to record music. Then I went to Clarksdale with my mom, saw the cotton fields, saw his old house, saw his old neighborhood. Clarksdale looks like one of those places that America forgot about, you know. Then me and my mom went to Nutbush, from Tennessee, so like Nutbush, Tennessee and Clarksdale, Mississippi are pretty much equidistant from Memphis. So, so then I went to Nutbush and there's nothing in Nutbush. There's less in Nutbush than in Clarksdale, Mississippi, which wow. makes sense why Tina Turner didn't want to go back. There's nothing there. Yeah. There's nothing there. So that gave me, like, I could smell it. Like I know what, you know, I felt that heat. It's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Mississippi is hot. I've never been to Mississippi. Mississippi is hot in August. That helped kind of just give me a little bit of context. You know, I, I had reference to put put it with. And that's the thing is you have a responsibility to tell the story, especially when you're playing people who actually lived, right? Right, right. Do you feel that? Oh, you have more responsibility because, you know, it's not really up for, you can, but I think it's a disservice to kind of use too much imagination. Like what uses much of the context? Because there's Tina, predominantly from I, Tina, you know, so you have I, Tina, but Katori Hall, who wrote the book, also read Ike's story. So it's like, it's layered, you know, there's, there's what, there's the story according to Ike, there's the story according to Tina. Somebody's lying somewhere, somebody's telling the truth. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's trying to at least honor their memories of how it went down. Also, Phila Lloyd, the director really allowed me, she asked me, you know, what do you think of playing this role? This is in the audition. And she, I was like, I care about what black men think when they come see themselves on this stage because oftentimes that's the only representation they have. So like if I am the representation of black men, I at least want a human being to be seen as opposed to just a monster. Like I understand he, he was a villain in, in every right and he did the things that he did, but in there is a being that hopefully the Ike Turners of the world can come see themselves and go, oh, I can make a change as opposed to, that ain't me, that's a monster. Yes, yeah. Did you feel a sense of responsibility that you are a black man playing a black man that is villainized? Yeah. And that especially in this country, in this world that we're living in, you know what I yeah, mean? You know, absolutely. You know, it started to, at one point, it got to me a little bit. I started, our trauma started to overlap. And I was like, wait, who's this who's? <laughs> Just mine or yours. Like, you know, that comes with it, which is also why I'm in therapy every Friday. You know, yep. um, it's not why I'm in therapy. I was already in therapy, but Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. it, it helps. So, um, you know, we feel the same way. Just about the art in general. Like, there's a responsibility in delivering whatever these things we're doing to the audience. There's a contract, which is like, I'm gonna be as authentic in my pretending as possible. So hopefully you can receive either a message or even maybe a little escape, or you can see yourself, something. That's the responsibility every day. Listen, I wanna get all technical with my notepad. Oh, notepads? Every time you do it, <laughs> can I see your answer? <laughs> what you got? You got for number three. <laughs> Can't see my work. Okay. <laughs> I just, I looked up the definition to responsibility just in the Webster's Dictionary. I'm more inspired to like actually look things up because of you. I really am because you do your research. Like you do that work. You got to. I know. Because people come for you and you gotta they just. They do. They come for you like, nope, let me see. Cause I read, I read here. I read it here. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta cite your sources. I read in so and so, so. Like your sources. Webster's Dictionary. Hey, it counts. Okay. Responsibility. The definition in the dictionary says the quality or state of being responsible. Moral, legal, or mental accountability. Hmm. Reliability and trustworthiness. Hmm. You know what I'm... Oh, shoot. I just lost my place. <laughs> <laughs> worth it. Worth a bit. Worth it. Well, that, that whole definition encapsulates why I want to talk to you, especially around the word of responsibility, especially in what we're going through right now. And I'm specifically talking about Black Lives Matter coming to the forefront 
and I want to articulate stuff, but then I want to let you talk. But we come to you when the times get real. This is why you guys, this is the light worker. This is this beautiful light worker of Daniel J. Watts. We come to you to help us. Black and white, all the colors, everybody wants to know what you have to say because you have this ability to articulate what's going on in our hearts or wherever we're at. And I just, do you know? I don't have time for these tears today. Uh, I know, but that's how we roll, but it's true. Do you know that? I'm learning to embrace that, you know, um, yes. <laughs> Everything you say is worth hearing. Uh, that's what's up. That's what's up. That's Thank what's up. you, that will, that's our show. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> Go back to the jam. Oh, the jam, real quick. The jam is based on my great grandmother who used to make jam. You can't make it a jar at a time, you have to make it in bulk. So she would make herself a jar and give the rest away. That's the spiel that I say. So I've been writing since I was like 12, 13, really writing. Just anytime I felt some kind of way, I would write. And really just for me, I wasn't sharing it until like I moved to New York and someone was like, you should share some of this stuff. Um, and that's kind of how the jam came about. So like I got a band together, it became a jam session. Like there's a line from a, a musical called Jelly's Last Jam. Um, in the intro, they say, we're jamming with Jelly tonight. And it's about Jelly Roll Morton. And I never thought about the wordplay of jamming with Jelly. And I was like, oh, that's clever. Jam versus Jelly. What's the difference between jam and Jelly? Jelly is like the runoff of jam. It's only the gelatin versus jam has the fruit and the seeds and the pulp. Like it still has all the stuff in it. So I was like, well, if I'm going to be one or the other, I'd rather be jam. So that's kind of how it all started. And now I have another jam coming up on the 29th, which is called Love Terrorists which is based on a poem that I wrote about terrorizing the world with love. Tagline is love is a weapon of mass construction. So that's- Love um, is a weapon of mass construction. I just need us to sit with that for a second. We're gonna build with love. It's a call to arms, it's a call to action. It's a, it's a moment to recognize what side of history you wanna be on. It's a conversation about love in general, the love that we've received love we've lost and how does that create human beings to go forward but mostly like learning how to love yourself more than anything you know we, we talked about it the other day like what does it mean to be loved you know is it to be loved by someone else or to be loved by yourself because if you can love yourself then it doesn't really matter <laughs> In order to make great change, we have to come at it with love. And love isn't passive. It's our responsibility to be extremely loving during mm -hmm. this time. And that includes exactly what you're saying, loving to ourselves. Yeah. Therefore, we can be loving to each other. Yeah. In all this. In all this, the idea of taking care of yourself, like this is actually the moment to take the most care of yourself because at nothing is known. Everything is uncertain and up in the air and every day we find out something new. Do you now feel that this is my responsibility? This is my purpose even during this time of COVID? The time's called. The time's called. So I, and I had it. I was like, I have the tools. I have the capability. I'd always been worried about doing the jam online, but I knew I had the benefit of everybody being at home. Yes. And everything being plugged in. Yes. So I was like, oh, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> you're at home. That's right. The pandemic had hit mm -hmm. and they shut Broadway down. I kind of, <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I was like, I'm just going to slide on that. I next to stage left and. The stage Thank left. You. And I got off social media. You know, I wasn't really on. And end of April when we started really hearing about Ahmaud Arbery. I'd been like paying attention to it and just, you know, Sean King was on top of it. So I was like, eh, I'll get to it. And then I was noticing nothing was happening and I was feeling some kind of way. And then I felt my silence because I happened to go on and the two times I got on, it was Sean King talking about Ahmaud Arbery in this case. The right two or three people hit me up saying, hey, just checking on you because I hadn't posted anything. It was the right three 
that made me go, ah, why am I, why I need, I had to investigate my silence. Why am I being quiet? And then I realized I'm silent because I'm exhausted because I don't know what to say because I've said it already. So I'll do a jam of a bunch of things I've already said. <laughs> yes. I don't have to write anything. I don't have to, it's all here. And then I realized in the doing of the jam, I started to feel stupid for having had said all of this stuff before and very little had changed. And I hadn't taken into consideration the small sparks or the small fires that may have been lit in it. I equated all the talking and all the stuff that I had done to having done very little or nothing at all. So that's what kept me going. I was like, okay, cool. And in the midst of working on the jam, Breonna Taylor's story got elevated even more. The week after I finished that jam, George Floyd was killed. You know, and I say in that jam, like, this is hunting season. Like, this is the time of year when the numbers start to go up, the hashtags start to happen again. It's just people are outside, evictions go up. There's just, there's just more activity. Then it clicked. I was like, okay, it's time to like really. So then I did another jam called The Next Time Is Now, focusing more on the education and the reading aspect and the learning about what is happening and why it's so hot right now and why silence can no longer be because we're not going to let it be. <laughs> so it's just like, <laughs> but <laughs> got it. You good? You've been talking, you've been doing this, you have been, you've been pulling your weight. And, and that, that really resonated, that was just like, I'm exhausted, we're exhausted, we aren't voiceless. We are, we have been, everything is, hear us, marching. It's and, there. And, <laughs> it's yeah. there. and now it's your responsibility to hear. Mm -hmm. Just hear it. Just hear it. Just hear it. And, and as we start to loosen up, the world opens up again. I know that this window is finite to really like do this work in this way. It's, I have a very narrow window. So it's kind of like driving me home. And I want to take, I, I do think it's a, a responsibility to also take care of the audience. The last two have kind of been whoopings. Yeah. <laughs> they've, been, they've been whoopings. And, but we were you know, ready. It was like, you were ready, you know. You were ready. You know, this is the jam. I said, it could be sweet, might get sticky, you know. And, and I appreciate the people who took the whoopings and invited somebody else to come along. So like this one is also, it's a little bit of open in there, but it's also like, it's my love letter back. Like, you know, thank y'all for like, thank y'all for being here. Thank y'all for listening. Thank y'all for being a part of the movement that you were already part of. You just didn't realize you needed to be more involved. Yes. Your, your allyship is not, I know that you will have my back if something goes down. I actually need you in the front lines now. I need your body in place with my body in case something goes down. That's what I feel like, and I just want to highlight for everybody watching. When Daniel does these jams, and it, we are listening to them and we're hearing, you walk away going, what is my responsibility here? Because you give us so much to think about. You make us feel, we, we are laughing and crying within the same thing. I want everybody to know, who's, everybody's going to come watch this jam now on the 29th, because it's just what's going to happen. But I realized within this that what my responsibility is, because I get in this thing where I'm like, oh, Daniel's got this. Because I remember the marches happening when Eric Garner was killed. And I remember them marching right outside my apartment even. And I remember looking out there and being like, woo, but no part of me went down there because I thought, I was like, they got this. That was my thought. They got this. Mm -hmm. I don't want to overstep and show up because they got this. This isn't, this isn't for me. And I was like, whoa, during this time, it just like was overwhelmingly yeah. like, yes, they got this and no, not without us, not without all of us collectively. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I remember when the women's march was happening, yeah. I almost did go because I was like, that ain't, and then it was like, wait, they talking to me. They talking to me. <laughs> Let me get out there. Yeah. Let me get out there. We out here. Yeah. We, you know, <laughs> we out here. That whole like, I don't want to step over. I don't want to step, you know, that thing. But it's like, oh, worst case scenario, somebody tells me to hush. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> worst case, someone says, get out of here. Yes. Worst case. Yeah, that was the thing. I had to get over that. I had to, that those, when those women's issues came to the front, 
<laughs> like as open-minded as I have been and I am and still knowing that I come up short, it was like, oh, just, okay, I gotta forgive myself for that one. And yeah. take and show, up. and show up. And show up. And so show ultimately, up. our responsibility, do we think, is to keep showing up for each other? Showing up. Yeah, because it's easy to get defensive when we find out that we haven't been showing up. And that's what you, and you want to go in the defense land first, you know, well, I've been busy or I've been, or I thought it's just like, just they're saying you haven't been showing up. That's it. <laughs> now, what do you want to do about that? That's it. I want to show up. It gets, it gets simple, you know, but when you get defensive and you feel called out and it's like, you no, you've been called up. Ooh, say that again. I like to cite my sources. Yes. I saw it in the comments section about somebody someone in the comments was like don't call her out like that and then someone responded to that say no she's not calling her out she's calling her up and I'm like, oh that's good i love that i want to use that for everybody that no matter what level you're at you're being called up so just maybe take responsibility to just level up just one level just one, see level. one level up one level up one level up it's, it's so it's it you level just think about that you're leveling up that's a good thing. That's if you great. level up, it's a wonderful thing. I feel excited. Like there's music in it, blah, blah, blah. Like there's a whole like, Come on. <laughs> like level up. Come on. Okay, so each week we do a marination station. I love that. Come on, Jam. Uh, marination. That's my jam. Marination. Marination. Marination station. So each week in this marination station, this is the station where we come to. Do you have something that's coming up for you around responsibility? That's the task that you want to task us with, of where we can take responsibility or how we can use that in this time in our lives. Yeah, I think you know more of the responsibility of being open to critique and not taking said crit criticism personally. Oh, that's good. Because it's not personal unless it's personal. Because there's no way, like there, I have a group of guys who I'm, um, they're on a, a matcha company, right? And I was talking to them the other day, it's called Matcha Bar, get into it, it's fantastic. Um, and plug. And they know just about anything and everything about sustainable energy. Mm. They know it, they're aware of it. I don't know half, I don't know a third, I don't know an eighth of what they know. So if they want to say, hey, Daniel, your carbon footprint is kind of, is, is a little whack right now. I could take that personally and be like, no, I'm trying my best. You know what I'm saying? I don't have a recycling bin in my, or I could just take the note, which is the truth. Yeah. I don't know as much as I could know about sustainable energy and carbon footprint and go do the research if I care. Yeah. You know what I mean? If I, or, or admit that I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> that is another or, option. That is the other option. Or admit that I don't care and see how that feels. Yeah. I mean, it's all, it all goes back to an investigation of the feelings and how that feels like. I actually don't want to feel like I don't care about the earth. So I do better. Yes. It's just, there, there's a million causes and things that you are unaware of. You just, for whatever reason, they're not in your environment, you know, there's women's issues, there's sex trafficking, there's, there's poverty, there's, there's a billion things that your heart can break over and you can't be focused on all of them. If you've missed one, you've missed one and then take the note. Yeah, so and stay, stay open, stay open and stay open to if somebody's like, here's what's up, <laughs> stay open. Stay open. I could literally talk to you for hours. This is why all day. All day. All day. Okay. We have only but breached the surface, but okay, I'm gonna quote you. Okay. Did you hear that button? That was like a train <laughs> button. I was like, I'm gonna call you. This okay. is how you finish one of your jams. Is it, so do I call this spoken word? Sure, spoken word storytelling, I don't know. I don't, I don't wanna put it in a box, Daniel. I don't know, I didn't, then don't. No, you say, it is your right to find your purpose. It is your job to be great. It's your destiny to mystify. So this is for the rest who are lost and feeling destitute. It's hard to feel full if you believe you're just a crescent moon. Hard standing tall when there's a giant next to you. So keep shining so they can see the best in you. Keep pressing through. Take with you the lessons you learn along the way. Crawl, walk, run, fly. You'll be jetting soon. It's imminent. As long as you do your due diligence until there's nothing left to do.
Now I'm crying. Oh, stop it. I can't. I can't with you. I'm done. Uh, that is it. You guys, I mean, I know that you just got so much out of this. So many nuggets of inspiration. You are just one of the most, but just even just your being and your soul is just, you are just one of the greatest people. And I'm just so grateful for you given this time. Oh, thank you. Everybody, watch the jam on yeah. the 29th on BET. Tell us. It's on BET Plus's Instagram uh, live. So don't, I mean, follow me, but don't follow me for the jam on the 29th. Go to BET Plus, at BET Plus. Uh, it'll be at 730 on that Monday. Eastern Standard yeah. Time. We're going to put all the info in the box below. I'll, I'll put Daniel's Instagram handle and stuff so that you can watch. There's some clips of your jam and everything on there. But and your hearts will be so full. And you'll just see that's like, this man should be having his own specials. Like every single person I know that sees this, we all feel that same way. And it's just a matter of time. Nobody's worried. That I am worried about that. It's a matter of time. But just thank you so much for everything that you do for us. I love you. Thank I you. I love you. Taking the responsibility. Pow. Pow. I like that. Be just uh, the bee. Hello, honey bee. I like that. Come on, honey bee. Take responsible. He's responsible like the bee. His purpose is is his purpose. <laughs> He's bubbles. He's bubbles. <laughs> you didn't hear me say responsibility. <laughs> See what I, yo, come on. Like positivity. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I had already forgot that song. Now, now I remember it. <laughs> I'm done with you. Thank you so much. Thank Sasha. you. I'll see you soon. I'll see you real, real life soon. Please, let's make that happen. Make all social, right, love you. Drink. Yeah. <laughs> At this point, after we take all this responsibility, just. <laughs> Uh, good to see you. <laughs> okay, I love you. I love you too. Bye.